opportunity wherever you are to contribute on our various social media pages. Today we're going to be looking at the Congo. So many things happening in the Congo. First of all, there's the issue of the Congo being one of the most resourced African countries, if I indeed one of the most resourced countries in the world. It practically has every mineral, gold, you know, diamonds, you know, so much. And yet, the Congo has no node peace for a very long time. And many of its people continue to wallow in poverty and so on. Then there's the issue of insurgency, rebellion, whatever you call it. Private armies, allegedly sponsored by Rwanda and so on the West jumping into the Congo and causing a lot of destabilization and so on. Today we have an opportunity to look at all of these issues and perhaps more. And today we're going to have somebody who is a comrade and who happens to be Congolese and who works with us today in Pan-African television and on several other projects. So we are going to invite this gentleman, Kambali Musuveli, to lead us in a discussion on the crisis in the Congo and the possible way out. The program is planned in such a way that he will start with introductory remarks and thereafter we'll come to the studio audience to make comments or raise questions and so on. And then we'll go to our social media platforms and thereafter he will come back to the microphone and make his closing remarks. My pleasure in inviting Kambali to the microphone. This is quite befitting to be having this presentation, uh, this discussion, uh, this palaver here in Ghana, uh, in Accra. And the reason why I start with that is because there were Congolese who came here. I will point that in 1958. Of course, probably before 1958, there were other Congolese who came. Uh, but those that I know are three Congolese, uh, Joseph Ngalula, Gaston Diomi, and Patrice Lumumba. Uh, invited to Ghana at the uh, All African People's Con uh, Conference that took place here. Um, the person who bought their ticket uh, is another African, a Pan-African, uh, Ras Makonnen. Uh, who financed a lot of the movements during that time. As they came here, uh, there were young, bright Congolese fighting in the country, uh, seeking to have uh, an independence right, from a form where they wanted to have equality with the Belgians. Right? They, if I may, must make a comparison with the history of Ghana, that you had people here who did not want total independence of Ghana. They wanted to be the governor of Ghana while still have British control, but Kwame Nkrumah wanted independence. So that movement at that time in the Congo was similar. But when they came to Ghana and they saw the vibrant movement that was here of all the young Africans, they were very inspired. And they were given a mission. Uh, they were given a mission to go to the Congo, organize, mobilize, and liberate the Congo from the uh, the end of the Belgians, uh, the Americans, because they needed the Congo's uranium, so that Congo could become the engine for the transformation of the Congo. And that project since 1958 is ongoing. It is why also we are discussing today. Today, in the, in the news, uh, in the international press, or even African press, they are discussing the Congo around uh, the conflict, the M23 rebels. But the struggle of 1958 and the struggle of the M23 today and what they are actually doing today is that Congolese are fighting to liberate themselves from the negative forces that make it impossible for Congolese and Africans to control their own affairs and control uh, their land. The second thing that I want to add about that is how difficult uh, and personal the situation is. Every day for the past month, we are receiving videos, we are receiving photos of the atrocities taking place uh, in the DRC. Uh, it's been going on for too long, for too long, since 1996. Uh, the estimated number, the very low number is that 
the conflict in the Congo has taken the lives of an estimated 6 million Congolese. And the statistics only look at the deaths in the Congo from 1998 to 2007. And we know up until today, people are dying. So we know that over 6 million Congolese have died, and we might never know how many millions have died in the Congo. So why are they dying? They are dying because they live on the land, as Common Kwasi said, that has wealth right now that is so essential to the fourth industrial revolution. Congo sits on cobalt. Congo is the number one producer of cobalt. You can't have an electric vehicle without Congo's cobalt. What is the fastest and cheapest way to get access to minerals? Displacement of population. How do you displace them faster? Through atrocities. So when you are killing people in public, in mass, what happens in a community tomorrow is that there will be a wave of people leaving the land. In the Congo, we have 7 million people who are not living in their homes. They've been displaced. Think about waking up in Accra and everybody in Accra is in Tamale. Because Accra is unstable and people are coming on the land here, uh, taking control of the land, exploiting the land and so on. Third now, I'll be much more concrete with what is happening. I mean, uh, the people who are living in the city of Goma, um, any day now, um, it is assumed that the city of Goma is going to fall into rebel hands. Uh, and the tension is quite vivid. So some of you have seen some of these news feed. You've also seen news feed where you saw young Congolese burning US flags, European Union flags, right? protesting in front of the US embassy. Why is all of this happening? Since 1996, Congo has known a war organized by our neighbors, Rwanda and Uganda, who are the so-called US allies on the war on terror. Uh, they work very closely between the United States and the United Kingdom. They invaded the Congo in 1996, toppling the long-time dictator Mobutu who lived, uh, who was in the country for 32 years. They invaded the Congo again in 1998, after the government of the Congo at the time asked the Rwandan and Uganda soldiers to leave the Congo. They reinvaded the Congo. They signed some peace accord in 2002, and since that time. Even though officially they say they are not in the Congo, they have supported proxy rebel militias. Today we are calling them the M23. And if you look at the names of the commanders of the M23 rebels that you see in the press, you will notice one name, for example, Sultani Makenga. And when you look at his history about where he's coming from, Sultani Makenga was a rebel leader in the first invasion of Congo in 1996. By 1996, his rebel group was not called M23. It was called AFDL. And what was the model of AFDL? The AFDL was a armed group to topple the regime of Mobutu as their state objective at the time, right? But he had Rwandan and Ugandan soldiers embedded in it with some Congolese traders or Congolese faces. So when you saw the AFDL, you had like Laurent Desiree Kabila as the face of the movement, yet, in the back, you had Rwandan soldiers and Ugandan soldiers. For you to get a sense of even why I'm saying this is to think about the size of the Congo. Right? Congo is the second largest African country by size and the fourth largest country uh, by population. Right? We have 110 million people now. Right? So it's a very vast country with a huge rainforest, the second largest rainforest in the world. And Rwanda is uh, the size of, even its population is the size of Kinshasa. It's a very tiny country, so it's not a country that has this power, right? So they have to have some form of external backing. That's why I'm making that clear is the United States and the United Kingdom. It's virtually impossible to walk from the eastern part of Congo to the west in the capital city of Kinshasa with weaponry if you are not lifted off by air. So how do we explain a small country such as Rwanda and the Ugandan military are able to take a country 10 times the size of the country, moving a military into a dense forest, crossing rivers without airplanes that we know? What are the airplanes in the world that lift off soldiers? C-37 planes, right? Who makes the C-37 planes? 
the United States. So we know that they could not have even invaded the Congo if there was no military backing of foreign powers to even help them logistically to move from east to west. But their invasions caused devastation. In 1997, as they were coming to take over the capital city, it is estimated they killed over 200,000 people, particularly in one of the refugee camps called Tingi Tingi. And this is one of the massacres that the UN High Commission for Human Rights published a report on October 1, 2010, saying that what's happening in the Congo are war crimes, crimes against humanity, and possible genocide if proven in the competent court. And that specific killing of 200,000 people is what constitutes genocide. Because the Rwandan military that participated in the massacre of these refugees can then explain why they died. Right? They did not die because they wanted to get to the goal. They died because of who they were. Right? So they intentionally targeted them. And today, as we're looking at the case with uh, Palestine, how uh, South Africa took uh, the um, Israelis to the ICJ, the same thing is true for the Congo, that we actually have a report that says there is genocide, but no action is taking place. So the second invasion of Tuna, as I shared, has taken the lives of over 6 million people. But in the process of the death, what has not stopped is the continuous flow of Congo's mineral resources. We have the largest cobalt deposit, as I mentioned. We even have the largest uh, deposit of lithium in the world, in Manono. Um, the Australians want it. So we also have multinational interests that are interested in having access to that. It's so blatant that even if I have to go back to 96, as the Rwandan and Uganda soldiers with Congolese as the face of the movement were fighting to topple Mobutu, you actually had mining corporations, right, with their officials on video till today, you can go online and see it, signing mining contracts with the rebels while there was still a government of Mobutu existent, right, that they knew that Mobutu was going to fall and they were signing the contract. And what were these contracts that they signed? Some contract, for example, if I have to name one of the mining companies, Banro, which is a Canadian mining company, they literally control a mine, Twangiza mine, in the eastern part of Congo, specifically in South Kivu, uh, near Mwenga. And this is a gold mine, right? And they control it at 99%, and Congo had a 1% stake in the project. Don't take my word for it. They actually published it on their website. When you go to their annual reports, when they're talking to the investors about the stake that the Congolese state has, and you ask yourself, who signed a contract where Congo get 1% and the mining corporations get 99%? Of course, they signed it in, uh, with people who had no interest of the Congo. That brings in now the third dynamics, right? The first dynamic that I spoke about is the neighboring countries were affecting Congo's politics by invading. The second one that I'm bringing up is the multinationals, uh, right? These corporations, in the instability that exists, make sure to come and sign odious deals which affect the people. The third one, which is going to be connected to what we all saw when I mentioned the flags, you know, the Congolese burning, US flags, uh, people being very excited. I know the Congolese people are now understanding what's happening, even including myself. I'm saying that young Congolese in the Congo are understanding that as we speak about Rwanda and Uganda, who are really agents of the West in the DRC, we have to be clear that their military power is coming from the West, just like for Israel, right? supported by uh, the West. The same is true for Rwanda and Uganda within the African continent. But what we have to look at in terms of the local struggle of the Congolese, how we are challenging our compadres, is that the week before the protest took place in front of foreign embassies, Congolese did a protest in front of our parliament. When they did the protest in front of our parliament, they were calling on the Congolese government to address a fundamental problem we've dealt with in the Congo for two years. And what is that problem? That there is a town in the Congo called Bunangana. And the town of Bunangana, for 600 days, is no longer under Congolese hands. Bunangana is at the border of Uganda. 
It's been taken over the, by the M23 rebel, and they literally control that town for two years now. No Congolese can go in. Even when we had the East African forces, they came in, they created a buffer where even they told the Congolese government, you can't go in there. So Congolese are saying this, we have an army, we have a government, they should deal with the issues of the Congo. They organize a protest. You know what happened to these young people? Seven of them were arrested by the security forces in the ERC. They were transferred, they were tortured, uh, whenever they, uh, wherever they took them. And then they were released three days after their arrest. But the week after, they are protesting in front of the U.S. Embassy, where flags are being burned. No one is arrested, right? Because you saw the images. You saw the you know, hundreds of people in front of the French Embassy, hundreds of people in front of the U.S. Embassy, hundreds of people in front of the uh, British Embassy as well in Kinshasa, demanding that these embassies be closed, which is a sentiment from the people, right? So we have to be clear that this is the sentiment of the people. But why weren't they arrested by the state? Because whenever Congolese are protesting the external forces, it doesn't affect the local compradors. So they are happy. They can hide around their incompetence, around them, them not addressing the fundamental issues in the country. So that's the third challenge that Congolese have to face. Right? We deal with our neighbors who are affecting uh, the security of our country, and which has led to the death of millions of people. We have to deal with multinationals who are getting into odious contracts, who are also are many, are many times also illegally looting the resources of the Congo. Many UN reports have already documented those uh, for those who want to dig deeper. And then we have to deal with our local elite, the compradors in, in our country, who uh, do not serve the interest of the people. And the full force that we have to deal with in the Congo is the multilateral institutions the World Bank and IMF. Just as the World Bank and IMF has affected Ghana, the same is true with the DRC. The World Bank actually wrote the mining law and wrote the forestry laws of the DRC. Way back in 2000, they brought in consultants to actually revisit that. And the Congolese civil society, if we should call them that, mobilized to actually challenge the new mining code that was being implemented by the World Bank and IMF. And what were they actually doing? They were actually changing our laws for mining companies to control the land from the top to the magma and have lease of 99 years for actually uh, mining and have so many tax holidays. Right? So that's one aspect of the multilateral institution. And you, you must also add the United Nations as a multilateral institution that has negatively impacted the Congo. How so? They have sent the biggest peacekeeping force in the DRC, yet there is no peace. And they have a $1.2 billion budget every year in the DRC for the operations. Of course, they're on their way out. Uh, the Congolese government has uh, have asked them that this year is the last year that we're going to have. But toward the 20 years of conflict in the DRC and the many lives lost, the impact of the UN in even addressing the deaths has not been felt. And the Congolese actually have protested uh, heavily over the years the departure of the United Nations forces. And the last visible protest that they organized was in August of uh, 2023. Unfortunately, those who protested, at least 200 of them were killed brutally uh, by the Republican Guard. The Republican Guard is a branch of the Congolese army. Guess who trained them? The Israeli Defense Force. The IDF trains the Congolese Republican Guard, which is the uh, force that uh, protects the Congolese president. And they kill civilians. And guess what those Israeli soldiers did in October? They were all, not all, 200 of them were recalled to Israel to go kill Palestinians pretty much. And a few remain to train the Congolese army. So I'm still making those connections to know that even in this context of speaking of the Congo, we must understand that there are may, much, many uh, forces uh, against the Congolese. And the last force that I will mention that the Congolese have to deal with is the NGO or the charity industry. 
you hear that millions of people are dead. You hear that hundreds of thousands of women have been brutally raped in DRC in horrific ways, if I have to even explain what is happening to the women, like literally destroying the reproductive part of the woman where they can't even have children. And you have hundreds of thousands of women in areas where uh, were being destroyed, which means that over a period of time, the population is going to decrease, right? So these NGOs are presenting the situation in the Congo from a charity uh, perspective that please help us, please donate to, I don't know, a hospital, please donate, no, more power to that work. But what it does is if you are asking for charity and you're not actually explaining to people who is killing them? Why are they killing them? How will the conflict end? So someone believed by donating $5 to a charity, then the conflict ends. Billions of dollars have been given to the charity industry in DRC, yet the conflict has continued. So if you put that map now of the forces that the Congolese face, right, and we think about the situation in Goma today, where a city of 2 million people, any day now, may be under rebel hands, the Congolese have to deal with the local elite, and challenge them. At the same time, they must make sure that Rwanda and Uganda are also checked in terms of the continuous invasions of DRC. Right? They also have to make sure that the mining companies who are coming to loot give us fair deals. Right? And there are others who are also doing it illegally. At the same time, they must watch out for the World Bank and IMF who may introduce a process that's going to affect their lives. And in the end, they must deal with those who are shaping the narrative of the Congo to the charity industry. How can the Congolese do that by themselves? That's why I strongly believe that for the conflict in the Congo that has taken the lives of millions in the DRC, it is not a task of the Congolese themselves to end that conflict. Just as Africans rallied to bring an end to the apartheid, the brutal apartheid regime in South Africa, today, the Congo movement is as important, that we must rally everyone and ask ourselves, while there were 26 African nations in Cote d'Ivoire participating in the football tournament, only one country had a political statement. That was the DRC. That the football players from the DRC took it upon themselves in the semifinal to raise their voice in letting people know that there is something fundamentally wrong that in the heart of Africa, a country that has so much wealth that can transform the entire African continent, that millions are dying and Africans do not know. But what is the way forward and why should we unite with the Congolese in liberating the country? I believe that if Congo is free, Africa is going to be free. And I'll explain why I say that. And I believe it. It's not just a rhetorical statement, right? The land of the Congo is so arable. If you think about the Congo, we have four growing seasons. Because Congo straddles the equator, right? And depending on the season, you can plant in different parts of the country and how big it is. Like every day of the year, you can grow food in the Congo. And its agricultural capacity can feed the entire African continent, the entire world, until our population gets to 9 billion people. Are there people starving in the world? We know they do. But our country alone can feed the whole world. But we do, we're not even harnessing the agricultural potential of the Congo where 86 million hectares of arable land is not even used. Right? The Congo River itself, and Kwame Nkrumah even talk about the Congo River, right? Well, it says that this river can provide electricity to the entire African continent. And he knew it in the 50s, and it's still true till today, that we, can't, we don't have to worry about Dumzo because we have the Congo River that can give us electricity. But Congo is not in the hand of Africans who want to transform at the moment. Congo has these challenges that I share. I can speak about the rainforest, how it's essential uh, to the fight for climate change. I can speak even about what I believe is the most important resource the Congo has is the youth of the Congo. And why I'm saying the youth specifically, right? When you think about the population of the Congo, we have 110 million people. 
half of the population is under the age of 18. And it's so visible when you get into Kinshasa, you see it. Or any town in, in Congo, you see a lot of young people, right? These young people do not have opportunities, right? And if given the opportunity to work, to transform the society, they'll do amazing things. They're telling us that the unemployment rate in the Congo is 93%. I don't know what it is in Ghana. But make the comparison, right? In Ghana, of course, we, we do have challenges, but we have 93%. Most of the young people I know do not have any jobs. And this is also a, a trend across the African continent. That's why a lot of young people not given the opportunity are rising up to say that we must have a say in the decision-making process. That I feel that the population of the Congo is the most important resource if they are not distracted by the wars um, that, that has taken uh, the lives of millions. And I will end by saying that um, what I said in the beginning is uh, really befitting to be in Ghana at the moment. I think the most days Patrice Lumumba spent in Ghana was probably one week. And he probably met a few young Africans, right? He was inspired by what was happening. And the meeting transformed not just the Congo and Africa, the, it was a movement for, if you think about it, they met in 1958. By 1960, a coalition of Pan-Africanists were in DRC. Most people do not know that. We had the Mau Mau in the Kasai region doing film screenings in the May of 1960 with the MNC of uh, Patrice Lumumba going into villages. We had André Bruin, she's from Central African Republic, who was working also with Patrice Lumumba. You had uh, Cameroonian, Chadian, you even had Serge Michel from Algeria with FNL who actually was also in DRC as an advisor to Patrice Lumumba. Not only that, Congo, Ghana, Mali, and Guinea had an alliance, right? Patrice Lumumba joined the alliance, the tripartite alliance between uh, Mali, Guinea, and uh, Ghana as a precursor to the organization Africa Unity, that there was a vision of what Africa could be if we were united. Today, we should start. Kwame Nkrumah and Patrice Lumumba spent the week together. Congolese today, right, are spending more time with Ghanaians. And we are understanding that millions of lives are lost, and we also understanding that Congolese are resisting by any means that they have, right? How can we lift up the story of the Congolese from a concrete perspective, either from outside, as he, he, uh, Kwame Nkrumah described in Challenge of the Congo, that Congo's uh, challenges are both internal and external. From outside, we put pressure on the external forces so that whenever you hear that Nana Kofuado, the president of Ghana, and the former president of Ghana, John Mahama, both were in Kinshasa on January 20th, 2024, at the inauguration of uh, Felix Shisekedi at the elections. I'm sure them coming back to Ghana, no one asked them questions about DRC, right? About Ghana's foreign policy toward DRC and what is the support they can provide to the DRC. South Africa has taken a stand. They are sending 2,900 uh, 2, troops to help the DRC uh, to stop uh, the militia groups. But there are many more uh, things that can be done. And I think in the question uh, part, as you ask the question, I'll provide more. But I want to open up our mind in saying, one week in 1960, in 2024, we spent more than one week together. Let's strategize on, from a very concrete perspective to make sure that we support our brothers and sisters in DRC to free themselves and understanding that they don't have one challenge to deal with, they have multiple challenges, but working with them to liberate the Congo, we transform the African continent. Thank you, Carmen, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Well, that was... Uh, brilliant, but also quite lengthy presentation from Kambali on the situation in the Congo. It's now time for the studio audience to raise issues, to ask questions, and then from there we can move to our social media handles. We don't have a lot of time, and uh, i like to see by hand those who have issues to raise about the Congo. By hand. <coughs> I see one. 
I see two. Well, so we're going to start with uh, Comrade Mensa, and then from there we'll come to the boss himself, Comrade Blaise Tulo. <coughs> Uh, uh, good evening, studio audience and viewers up there. I'm just imagining how the countryside of <coughs> Congo will be. If you've been to the war zone, can you imagine people just with arms, just moving about, clearing people on the way. If I lay in siege, it means uh, farming. There will be no farming. People won't go to their farms. People will just be hurriedly getting to a a safer place and all those things. And this humanity we are talking about. I don't know why up to now African leaders have not stood up against this mess that is happening. I read a few things about and they said there are about some few hours towards Goma and very soon they are going to take that city and the rest. So what are Africans doing? Thinking about lives that have been lost and all those things. So we played. I think this is something we have to sit down and think about, see what we can do to support our brothers in the Congo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kambale, for putting the crisis that is happening in the DRC into a better context. Um, for us here in Ghana, um, on the 24th of February, we will be celebrating Ghana's Day of Shame. Congo has remained a very important country for Ghana, even at the type, time of uh, Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And Nkrumah paid a lot of attention to the situation that is happening there. Fast forward, this is where we are. There's been a lot of um, demonstrations at the forecourts of the United States of America, which is for me very instructive. It shows the resistance of our people. You know, at a time when the CIA was plotting to overthrow Nkrumah, there were lots of protests happening at the embassy of the United States of America. I, one cannot tell, but all these actions have underlining consequences, and it just shows us that we should pay a lot more attention and see how we can, you know, whatever intervention we can make at our level. But Congo is very key. The resources that are in Congo, we know very well are serving the interests of multinational corporations in the United States of America. And we shouldn't take these actions that are happening in DRC as actions that are in isolation. We must speak in attention and be involved in the struggles that are happening there. But I am, I am most impressed about the level of resistance that we are seeing at the DRC. And DRC will certainly be free. Thank you very much. Well, the Congo tells the story. There are so many people around the world when they see the tall buildings in the West and they see the nicely paved roads and so on. They think that people of the West are very hard working. That it is capitalism which has generated that wealth and, and, and so on. The stories, like the story of the Congo, is not told. Because that is what the world actually comes from, you understand? And uh, <clears throat> perhaps we have to remind ourselves that it was in the Congo that King Leopold of, 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 of uh, Belgium actually made his world through the establishment of rubber plantations, and the Africans were worked like cows. The Congolese were worked like cows. If they failed to deliver the right amount of rubber which was needed, you could lose your arm. You lost your arm. Amputation was the punishment. We cannot forget that when the Congolese people elected their own leader, the nationalist leader, Patrice Lumumba, and the West was not happy with that because they still wanted to control the Congo and so on. They killed him. They did not just kill him. They killed him. They removed his front teeth as souvenir and they dissolved his body in acid. 
Of course, the story of Ghana is not different, and so on. <clears throat> okay. Now, when we are asked to follow the path of the West, what does it really mean? That we should be amputating people who don't bring enough rubber? We should be killing leaders who do not allow us to exploit them, remove their front teeth, dissolve their body in acid, and so on? We should continue to create the kind of situation which is happening in the Congo today, and so on? Horrible. Our path to development, our path to prosperity, does not lie in following the West. It lies in collective self-reliant development and a new model of development designed under the ages of socialism. That's the only part that we do have. We still have a few minutes left, and uh, my pleasure to invite Abdul Haq to the microphone to give us the messages from social media. Abdul Haq. Okay. Thank you, comrade. Uh, I think today we have a lot of messages coming in from our WhatsApp and also from text messages and on our live stream on Facebook, of course. So I'll start with the comments coming in from Facebook. Uh, this is coming from Dinah Wood. And she says, when we read the challenges of the Congo, it felt like we were reading a history book by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and tries to analyze the situation then. But today's presentation brings a lot of logical reasons to mind. Thank you, Comrade Kambali, for the insightful presentation. That's from Dinah Wood. And thank you for watching. You are one of our lawyer viewers on Facebook. <laughs> this is coming from Ibrahim. He says, Ghana stands with Congo. And that was a masterpiece from you, comrade. All the Africans and the people of the world must stand with Congo. Uh, this is also coming in saying, hello, I enjoyed the presentation. Well, thank you for watching us. And this also says, the story of Africa can never be fully understood without the history of Congo. The West has always been consistent in their approach across the world, and Congo is no different. And that is from Abdul, also sharing the messages there. And this simply says, well done. And that's coming from Mohammed Abdullahi. Thank you for the message and thank you for watching. Uh, this is also saying, I've never heard any media house showing content like this except on Pan-African TV. I'm watching you from Nigeria. Thank you. Samuel Chiduben. Thank you, Samuel, for that message. Emmanuel Okori also says, thank you and well done. Thank you and well done. Thank you and well done. And Faris Kumi says, I'm very happy with the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Kambali. I mean, next time when you are sending the message, tell us where you are sending it from. It helps us to also know where you are watching us from and where you are at the moment. I will take a few more from our WhatsApp. Okay. So this is simply saying, oh, you are not telling us your name. Hello, please. Where are you located? Oh, we are at Abelinkpe. If you want to join the studio audience, just come to Abelinkpe on the 48th Swanika Street, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, number 48th Swanika Street. You see us right at the corner on Wednesdays, every Wednesday, 5.30 p.m. You are you can join the studio audience and oh this is taking off off topic but it's interesting Baumia has Mia himself today I don't know how it fits into today's discussion but thank you for the comment uh, this also says oh no lunch today how about lunch I'm not sure which program you are watching it's a text message okay this says 
the reshuffle of the president okay now this is out of context yeah this is coming from the name is leader Kobina. he says i'm enjoying your show from kasua thank you for the education i'm well informed about what is happening in congo and kudos to pan african tv kudos to you to Kobina from kasua thank you for the message this simply says hi well hi to you too hope you are enjoying the show okay this is coming from dr nonomi dr nonomi i hope i'm pronouncing the name correctly and he says good evening pan-african tv it is interesting to hear about the story of the congo on in a pan-african television Okay, it's a bit mixing. On Pan-African television, because I know there was no other TV station where I can watch to hear any analysis on what is happening in DRC. Thank you for bringing this program to us, and we appreciate it. Kudos to you. Kudos to you too. Nonome, doctor. Nonome. Uh, oh, this says, please, I need honorable, agon, whatever. Okay. It's not on the show okay this is also coming from oh no this baumia is getting plenty okay so thank you i think i'll stop here and then we'll continue with this so thank you so much well at this stage you'd like to invite comrade kambale uh, to come to the microphone once again and to give us his closing remarks comrade kambale One thing I felt to do was to kind of explain um, the size of the Congo and the context of the geopolitics of the region. Congo, as I said before, is a huge land. Uh, it has nine bordering nations. Right? It's the only African country with nine bordering nations. So whatever happens there affects nine countries and can go across the continent. And two of our neighbors, Rwanda and Uganda in the east, as I've mentioned, have impacted the Congo. Rwanda and Uganda are the King Leopolds of today. Right? You see, when we speak about King Leopold, eh, we even speak about the Berlin Conference, the so-called Berlin Conference. The United States was at the Berlin Conference. If you read the Act of Berlin, the United States signed the Act of Berlin. They didn't get the territory, but they got something. They got King Leopold. The rubber that King Leopold was extracting from the DRC ended up in the United States because there was a boom in the car industry, and especially the bicycle, the tires of the bicycles, and Ford making the new cars, that's where they were getting the wealth. So while he enriched himself, the, he could not have done it without the backing of the United States. The United States was the first country in the world to recognize the Congo as a personal property of King Leopold. So it's important to do that. Fast forward to today. What is Rwanda and what is Uganda? What are they doing in the DRC? They are pilfering Congo's resources. They are also taking uh, Swatzer land. As I gave you an example, that it's not even an example, it's a con concrete situation that's taking place, right? That the town of Bunangana for the past 600 days is under rebel control at the border of Uganda. While Ugandan border patrol and the Ugandan military are watching. So they are actually allowing them to destabilize. And not only that, there have been numerous reports, right, describing the illicit flow of Congo's minerals into Kigali, Rwanda, and Kampala, Uganda. For example, Congo has 64 to 70% of the world's reserve of coltan. Coltan is a mineral found in your cell phone, in your laptop, in your DVD players, in your electronic devices. Rwanda today is the number one exporter of coltan. And they don't have these reserves of coltan at the volume that they are selling it in the world. Everyone buying coltan from Rwanda know that it's coming from the DRC. But everyone closes their eyes. Same is true for Uganda, right? In terms of even the gold uh, ex export to the United Arab Emirates, that they're one of the largest exporters of gold today 
Where is the gold coming from Uganda? So they're pilfering the resources. On one hand, there is the illicit flow of resources that they are benefiting directly. On the other hand, are clearly stated that Rwanda and Uganda are US allies on the war on terror. How do they benefit from that? That's how you have Ugandan soldiers in Iraq, you have Ugandan soldiers in Afghanistan, you have Rwandan soldiers who have played US interests, military operations around the world. Rwandan soldiers were in Haiti. People forget that. They were in Mali, right? Right now, they are in Mozambique playing not just U.S. interests, right? Also French interests because they are protecting uh, the interests of a French company called Total. And we all watch the African Cup that says Total Energies, and people didn't even make a connection. Why is a French oil company sponsoring um, a African tournament? pretty much whitewashing what they are doing on the African continent and the destabilization of Mozambique. So, and, and the last would be also that they are intelligence hub and military hub for the United States. Gaddafi could not have been toppled militarily if they did not use the Entebbe airports in Uganda as the base for the attacks to Libya. Right? NATO and U.S. forces were in and Tebe in Uganda in those military operations. So that's the role that Rwanda and Uganda is playing, and I'm connecting it to the role that King Leopold did. Uh, so it's not about the Rwandan people, because the Rwandan people themselves in their country, they are fighting for representation. They are fighting the government that was, uh, that's been in power for over 20 years. Same thing in Uganda. Museveni has been in power since 1986. Ugandans are also fighting to transform their country. It's the elite, it's the bourgeoisie, it's the indigenous bourgeoisie, uh, the compadors of those countries who have united to destabilize the Congo. But for the Congolese, we are still hopeful. No, we are hopeful. Like I said, I was very pleased to see uh, the youth for the Congo in front of those embassies. But I'm also uh, clear that we need ideological grounding, uh, the grounding that, that will make sure that we understand that it's not just the United States. Right? It's the whole entire capitalist system and how it works to oppress us. And I'm confident in our you know, practice, in our concrete realities, the youth will come out of that. And that's where we need the support and the unity uh, to liberate the Congo. And I'm inviting all of you to the DRC. Um, whenever you are able to, you should come and see how, um, don't just remember the Congo for the music. It's one of the biggest exports that we have. Uh, Congolese music that also give you a sense of the spirit of the people that we are tied to our culture we are tied to our music and that's been one of the things that have helped us in this difficult time come to the Congo and let's work together to liberate the Congo well comrades all too soon we have to draw the curtains on this edition of Wednesday Palava. But as hinted by Comrade Blaise Tulo, on the 24th of February, we'll be observing Ghana's Day of Shame, the day on which we examine the effects of the overthrow of the Nkrumah government by the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States of America. I do know that the producers would have to determine what topic we discuss next week and so on, but it does appear to me that it is impossible to escape a discussion of the day of shame and its full implications. So please stay with us next week as we discuss the day of shame. And this year's day of shame is so very special because this is the day we have dedicated to the launching of the fourth edition of the Great Deception, how the CIA overthrew Nkrumah, and it will be done, the launching of the book will be done by Professor Vijay Prashad, who is the Executive Director of the Tri-Continental Institute for Social and Economic Research. He will be in Ghana to do the launching. Um, Professor Ekwia Brichum has been invited to do the review of the book, and all of this will be under the chairmanship of Dr. Yao Graham, coordinator of the Third World Network. So all of you at home 
all of you on various social media platforms. And all of you can come to the studio. Next week, we shall be looking at the Ghana's Day of Shame a day which was so dedicated by the Socialist Movement of Ghana about 30 years ago. And on the day itself, which is Saturday the 24th of February, we expect all of you to join us in observing that day at the headquarters of the Socialist Movement of Ghana um, on the George Wakabush Highway next door to the Noga Hill Hotel from 4 p.m. I'd like to say a big thank you to Comrade Kambali for giving us such an incisive <laughs> presentation on the Congo. And thank you to those of you who came into the studio. And thank you to all of you who watch us at home, in your offices, and on the various social media platforms. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.